Chapter Four of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rest. Rumors were rife again, and mostly right this time. The C.O. knew the part we were going to: a chalk country, rolling downs, four or five weeks rest, field training thirty miles from the firing line. Chalk downs. To a Kentish man, the words were magic after the dull sodden flats of Flanders. I longed for a map of France, but could not get hold of one. As we marched to Lillea, I looked at the flat straight roads and the ditches, at the weary monotony, uninspired by hill or view, at the floods on the roads, and the uninteresting straightness of the villages, and I felt that I was at the end of a chapter. Any change must be better than this. And chalk, chalk, short dry turf, and slopes with purple woods. I had forgotten these things existed. I forget the name of the village where we halted for two nights. I had a little room to myself, reached by a rickety staircase from the yard. One shut the staircase door to keep out the yard. Here several new officers joined us, Clark being posted to our company, and soon I began to see my last two months as history. For we began to tell our adventures to Clark, who had never been in the firing line. Think of it, he was envious of our experiences. So I listened in awe, and heard a tale develop, a true tale, the tale of the night the mine went up. It was no longer a case of disputing how many trench mortars came over, but telling an interested audience that trench mortars did come over. Clark had never seen one, and I listened agape to hear myself the hero of a humorous story. When the mine went up, I had come out of my dug-out rather late, and asked if anything had happened. This tale became elaborated. I was putting my gloves on calmly, it seems, as I strolled out casually, and asked if anyone had heard a rather loud noise. And so stories crystallized, a word altered here and there for effect, but true, and as past history quite interesting. The move was made the occasion, by our C.O., of very elaborate and careful operation orders. No details were left to chance, and a conference of officers was called to explain the procedure of getting a battalion on a train and getting it off again. As usual, the officers' valises had to be ready at a very early hour, and the company mess-boxes packed correspondingly early. Edwards, I think, was detailed as O.C. loading party. Everything like this was down in the operation orders. The adjutant had had a time of it. Certainly the entraining went like clockwork, and once more I was seated in a grey upholstered corridor carriage. The men were in those useful adaptable carriages inscribed, Chevaux ten, Olm thirty. Our Tommies were evidently a kind of centaur class, for they went in by twenties. As far as I can remember, we entrained at ten a.m., we arrived at a station a few miles from Amiens at 9 p.m. A slow journey, but I felt excited like a child. I must keep going to the corridor to put my head out of the window. It was a sparkling, nippy air, the smell of the steam, the grit of the engine. These were things I had forgotten, and soon there were rolling plains, hills, clustering villages. The route through Saint-Pont, Doulin, and Canaple is ordinary enough, no doubt. And so, too, the gleam of white chalk that came at last. But if you think that ordinary things cannot be wonderful beyond measure, then go and live above ground and underground in Flanders for two months on end in winter. Then, perhaps, you will understand a little of my good spirits. It was quite dark when we arrived. Then, for three and a half hours, we waited in a meadow outside the station, arms piled, the men sitting about on their waterproof sheets. Meanwhile the transport detrained, a lengthy business. Tea was produced from those marvellous field kitchens. The night was cold, though, and it was too damp to sit down. For hours we stood about, tired. Then came the news that our six-mile march would be more like double six, that the billets had been altered. At half-past twelve we marched off. It was starlight, but pretty dark. Eighteen miles we marched, reaching Montagne at half-past seven. 
Every man was in full marching kit, and most of them carried sandbagfuls of extras. It was a big effort, especially as the men had done nothing in the nature of a long march for months. Well I remember it, the tired silence, the steady tramp along the interminable road. Sometimes the band would strike up for a little, but even bands tire, and cannot play continuously. Mile after mile of hard road, and then the hedges would spring up into houses, and from the opened windows would gaze down awakened women. Hardly ever was a light shown in any house. Then the village would be left behind, and men shifted their packs and exchanged a sandbag, unslung a rifle from one shoulder to the other, and settled down to another stretch, wondering if the next village would be the last. So it went on interminably all through the winter night. Once we halted in a village, and I sat on a doorstep with O'Brien, discussing methods of keeping our eyes open. Edwards had been riding the horse, and had nearly tumbled off asleep. At another halt, halfway up a hill, I discovered a box of beef lozenges, and distributed among number six platoon. All the last ten miles I was carrying a rifle and a sandbag. Sergeant Callaghan had the same, besides all his own kit. Sergeant Andrews kept on as steady as a rock. There were falterers, but we kept them in. Only in the last two miles did one or two drop out. And all the while I was elated beyond measure. Partly at seeing men like Ginger Joe, with his dry wit flashing, and Tudor, with his stolid power but partly, too, at the climb uphill, the swing down, mysterious woods, and the unmistakable trunks of pines. And all the time we were steadily climbing. We must be upon a regular tableland. Dawn broke, and it got lighter and lighter, and so we entered Montagna. The quartermaster had had a nice job billeting at two a.m., but he had done it, and the men dropped on to their straw, into outhouses, anywhere, the accommodation seemed small and bad, but that could be arranged later. To get the men in, that was the main thing. One old woman fussed terribly, and the men looked like bayonetting her. We soon got the men in somehow. Then for our own billets. We agreed to have a scratch breakfast as soon as it could be procured. Meanwhile I went to the end of the village and found myself on the edge of the tableland. Before me was spread out a great valley, with a poplar-lined road flung right across it. Villages were dotted about, there were woods and white ribbon by-roads, and over it all glowed the slant morning sun. I was on the edge of a chalky plateau. It was all just as I had imagined. I slept from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., when I got up for a meal at which we were all short-tempered, and at 9 p.m. I retired again to sleep till 7 next morning. Montagne! How shall I be able to create a picture of Montagne? As I look back at all those eight months, the whole adventure seems unreal, a dream. Yet somehow those first few days in the little village had for me a dreamlike quality, unlike any other time. I think that then I felt that I was living in an unreality, whereas at other times life was real enough and it is only now, afterwards, that these days are gradually melting through distance into dreams. At any rate, if the next few pages are dull to the reader, let him try and weave into them a sort of fairy glamour, and imagine a kind of spell cast over everything, in which people moved as in a dream. First there was the country itself. The next day, after a day's sleep and a night's on top of it, was, if I remember right, rather wet, and we had kit inspection in billets, and tried to eke out the hours by gas-helmet drill, and arm drill in squads distributed about the various farmyards and barns. Then Captain Dixon decided to take the company out on a short route march, and as it was raining very steadily, we took half the company with two waterproof sheets per man. One sheet was thrown round our shoulders in the usual way, the other was tied kiltwise round the waist. The result was an effective rain-proof, if unmilitary-looking, dress. We set off and soon came to a large wood with a broad ride through it. Along this ride we marched, two deep now, and I at the rear as second in command. 
here i felt most strongly that strange glamour of unreality it was but three months ago and i was in the heart of wales yet such was the effect of a few months that i looked on everything with the most exuberant sense of novelty the rain beads on the red-brown birch trees the ivy the oaks the strange stillness in the thick wood after the gusts of wind and slashes of rain especially the sounds chattering jays invisible peeping birds the squelching of boots on a wet grass track everything reminded me of a past world that seemed immeasurably distant of past winters that had been completely forgotten then we emerged into a wide clearing along the edge of the wood full of stunted gorse and junipers long coarse grass grew in tussocks that matted underfoot and now i could see the whole company straggling along in front of me slipping and sliding about on the wet grass in their curious kilt-like costumes some of which were now showing signs of uneasiness and tending to slip in rings to the ground every one was very pleased with life a halt was called at length and while officers discussed buying shotguns at amiens or stalking the wily hare with a revolver tommy i have reason to believe was planning more effective ways of snaring brer rabbit next day in orders appeared an extract from corps orders re prohibition of poaching and destruction of game it was all part of the dream that we were surprised almost shocked at this unwarranted exhibition of property rights not that there was much game about anyhow the next day we did an advance guard scheme down in the plain it was a crisp winter day and i remember the great view from the top of the hill on the edge of the plateau as you leave montagne it was all mapped out with its hedgeless fields its curling white roads and its few dark triangles and polygons of fir woods but we had not long to see it for we came into observation then so this dream game pretended and were soon in extended order working our way along over the plain it all came back to one this open warfare business the advancing in short rushes the flurried messages from excited officers to stolid platoon sergeants the taking cover the fire orders the rattling of the bolts the lying on the belly in a ploughed field and yes the spectator old man or woman gazing in stupid amazement at the khaki figures rushing over his fields then came the assault bayonets fixed and the c o s whistle ending the game for that day game that was it it is all a game and when you get tired you go home to a good meal and discuss the humour of it and probably have a pow-wow in the evening in which the o c a is asked why he went off to the left the real answer being that he lost direction badly but the actual answer given explaining the subtlety of a detour round a piece of dead ground which is the dream this or the mud-slogging in the trenches and the interminable nights for every night we went to bed think of it every night always that bed that silence that priceless privacy of sleep i had a rather cold ground-floor billet with a door that would not shut yet it was worth any of your beds at home and i should be here for a month perhaps six weeks i wrote for my basin and stand for books for all sorts of things i felt i could accumulate and spread myself it was like home after hotels for always we had been moving moving even our six days out were often in two or even three different billets so too with our mess the dream here consisted of a jolly little parlour that was the envy of all the other company messes as usual the rooms led into one another the kitchen into the parlour the parlour into a bedroom i might almost continue and say the bedroom into a bed for the four-poster when curtained off is a little room in itself it was a good billet but best of all was madame herself suffice it to say she would not take a penny for use of crockery and she would insist on us making full use of everything she allowed all our cooking to be done in her kitchen and on cold nights she would insist on our servants sitting in the kitchen though that was her only sitting-room often have i come in about seven o'clock to find our dinner frizzling merrily on the fire under the supervision of gray the cook 
while madame sat humbly in the corner eating a frugal supper of bread and milk before retiring to her little room upstairs ah madame there are many who have done what you have done but few i think more graciously if we tried to thank her for some extra kindness she had always the same reply you are welcome monsieur le officier i have heard the guns and the germans passed through amiens if it were not for the english where should we be to-day so we settled down for our rest for long field days lectures after tea football matches and weekends i wrote for my field service regulations and rubbed up my knowledge of outposts and visual training but scarcely had i been a week at montagne when off i went suddenly on a sunday morning to the third army school i had been told my name was down for it a few days before but i had forgotten all about it when i received instructions to bicycle off with sergeant roberts my kit and servant to follow in a limber i had no idea what the third army school was but with notebook pencil and protractor i cycled off at eleven a m to fields and pastures new most people i imagine have had the following experience they have a great interest in some particular subject yet they have somehow not got the key to it they regret that they were never taught the elements of it at school or it is some new science or interest that has arisen since their school days such as flying or motoring they are really ashamed of asking questions and all books on the subject are technical and presuppose just that elementary knowledge that the interested amateur does not possess then suddenly he comes on a book with those delicious phrases in the preface promising to avoid all technical details apologizing for what may seem almost childishly elementary and containing at the end an expert bibliography these are the books written by very wise and very kind men and because they are worth so much they usually cost least of all such was my delightful experience at the army school i will confess to a terrible ignorance of my profession i did not know how many brigades made up a division the artillery were to me vague people whom the company commander rang up on the telephone and who appeared in gaiters in bethune a bomb was a thing i avoided with a peculiar aversion and as to the general conduct of the war i was the most ignorant of pawns the wildest things were said about Luz. the daily mail had just heard of the falker and i had not the remotest idea whether we were hopelessly outclassed in the air or whether perhaps after all there were people up top who were not so surprised or disconcerted at the appearance of the falker as the northcliffe press moreover i had been impressed with the reiteration of my c o that my battalion was the finest in the army and that my division was likewise the best yet i had always felt that there were other good battalions and that k s army was to say the least of it in a considerable majority when compared with the contemptible little original which i had had the luck to join imagine my delight then at finding myself one of over a hundred captains and senior subalterns representing their various battalions regulars territorials and kitcheners we were all there together one's vision widened like that of a boy first going to school here at last was a great opportunity if only the staff was good and any doubt on that question was instantly set at rest by the commandant's opening address explaining that the instructors were all picked men with a large experience in this war that in the previous month's course mostly subalterns had been sent and this time it had been the aim to secure captains only oh bomb and gilead this and that apologies were due if some of the lectures and instructions were elementary that bombing experts for instance must not mind if the bombing course started right at the very beginning as it had been found in the previous course that it was wrong to presume any military knowledge to be the common possession of all officers in the school those who understood my simile of the expert's kind book to the amateur will understand that there were few of us who did not welcome such a promising bill of fare i do not intend to say much about the instruction at the army school 
a good deal of what i learned there is unconsciously embodied in the rest of this book but it is the spirit of the place that i want to record i can best describe it as the opposite of what is generally known as academic theories and textbooks about the war were at a discount here were men who had been through the fire every phase of it it was not a question of opinions but of facts this came out most clearly in discussions after the lectures a point would be raised about advancing over the open we attacked a saint julien over open ground under heavy fire and such and such a thing was our experience would at once come out from some one and there was no scoring of debating points we were all out to pool our knowledge and experience all the time the commandant inspired in everyone a most tremendous enthusiasm his lectures on morale were the finest i have ever heard anywhere put yourself in your men's position on every occasion continually think for them give them the best possible time be in the best spirits always long faces were anathema no one can forget his tale of the doctor who never laughed and whom he put in a barn and taught him how to hail fellow well met to all other officers and regiments was another of his great points give em a damned good lunch a damned good lunch get a good mess going ask your brigadier into lunch in the trenches make him come in concerts plenty of concerts in billets an extra turn of rum to men coming off patrol all this was a good show but long faces in hospitality men not cheerful and singing officers not seeing that their men get their dinners after getting into billets before getting their own officers supervising working parties by sitting under haystacks instead of going about cheering the men brigadiers not knowing their officers poor lunches all these things were a bad show a damned bad show these lectures were full of the most delicious anecdotes and thrilling stories and backed up by a huge enthusiasm and a most emphatic practice of his preaching we had a concert every wednesday and every saturday the four motor buses took the officers into amiens and the sergeants on sundays weekends were in fact good shows then there were the lectures the second week for instance was a succession of lectures on the battle of Luz. these lectures used to take place after tea and the discussion usually lasted till dinner first was a lecture by an infantry major of the seventh division who needless to say had been very much in it then followed one by an artillery officer giving his version of it then followed an r e officer there was nothing hidden away in a corner it was all facts 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 an enlarged map of our own and the german trenches was most fascinating to us who had for the most part never handled one before i remember the major's description of the fighting in the quarries it was one of the most vivid bits of narrative i have ever heard then there were other fascinating lectures captain jeffreys the big game hunter on sniping the commandant again on patrol work and discipline and dealing with prisoners two lectures from the royal flying corps perhaps most fascinating of all we drilled hard with rifles we took a bombing course and threw live bombs we went through the gas and had a big demonstration with smoke bombs we went to the squadron of the r f c inspected the sheds saw the aeroplanes and had anything we liked explained we went out in motor buses and carried out schemes of attack and defence we did outpost schemes drew maps dug trenches and revetted them in short there was very little we did not do at the school it was in fact a good show the school was in a big white chateau on the main road a new house built by the owner of a factory the village really lies like a sediment at the bottom of a basin with houses clustering and scrambling up the sides along the high road running out of it east and west getting thinner and fewer up the hill to disappear altogether on the tableland the jute factory was working hard night and day we used to have hot baths in the long wooden troughs that are used for dyeing long rolls of matting and i know no hot baths to equal those forty footers 
Needless to say, we took advantage of our commandant's arrangement for free bus rides into Amiens every Saturday. Christmas Day, falling on a Saturday, we all had a Christmas dinner at the Hôtel de l'Universe. This, needless to say, was a good show. It was a pity, though, that turkey had been insisted on, as turkey with salad minus sausages, bread sauce, and Brussels sprouts did not seem somehow the real thing. The chef had jibbed at sausages especially. Better at Rome to have done completely as Rome does. After all, we cannot give the French much advice in cooking or in war. Otherwise the dinner was good, and unlike our folk at home we had a merry Christmas. Of course, I went to see the cathedral that Ruskin had claimed to be the most perfect building in the world. Indeed, each Saturday found me there. For like all true beauty, the edifice does not attract merely by novelty, but satisfies the far truer test of familiarity. Yet I confess to a thrill on first entering that dream in stone, which could not come a second time. For down in the mud I had forgotten, in the obsession of the present, man's dreams and aspirations for the future. Now, here again, I was in touch with eternal things that wars do not affect. I remember once at Malvern we had been groping and choking in a thick fog all day. Then someone suggested a walk, and three of us ventured out and climbed the beacon. Halfway up the fog began to thin, and soon we emerged into a clear sunshine. Below lay all the plain wrapped in a great level blanket of white fog. Here and there the top of a tall tree or a small hill protruded its head out of the mist and seemed to be laughing at its poor hidden companions. And in a cloudless blue the sun was smiling at mankind below who had forgotten his very existence. So in Amiens Cathedral I used to get my head out of the thick fog of war for a time, and in that stately silence recover my vision of the sun. The cathedral is a building full of all the freshness of spring. I was at Vespers there on Christmas afternoon, and was then impressed by the wonderful lightness of the building. So often there is gloom in a cathedral that gives a heavy feeling. But Amiens Cathedral is perfectly lighted, and in the east window glows a blue that reminded me of viper's buglos in a swiss meadow my imagination flew back to the building of the cathedral and to the brain that conceived it and beyond that again to the tradition that through long years moulded the conception and behind all to the idea the ultimate birth of this perfect creation and one seemed to be straining almost beyond humanity to see the first spring flowers looking up in wonder at the sky. The stately pillars were man's aspiration towards his creator, the floating music his attempt at praise. Yet it was only as I left the building that I found the key to the full understanding of this perfect expression of an idea. Round the chancel is a set of bas-reliefs, depicting a saint labouring among his people. But what people! they live they speak the relief is so deep that some of the figures are almost in the round and several come outside the slabs altogether they are the people of medieval amiens they are the very people who were living in the town while their great cathedral rose stone by stone to be the wonder of their city the pride of all picardy almost gruesome in their vivid humanity they are the same people who walk outside the cathedral today. The master artist, greater in his dreams than his fellow men, was yet blessed with that divine sense of humour that made him love them for their quaint smallnesses. So in Amiens I felt a double inspiration. There was man's offering of his noblest and most beautiful to his creator, and there was also the reminder, in the saint among the Amiens populace, that God's answer was not a proud bend of the head, as he deigned to accept the offering of poor little man, but a coming down among them, a claiming of equality with them, even though they refuse still to realize their divinity, and choose to live in a self-made suffering, and to degrade themselves in a fog of war. All too quickly the month went by. The enthusiasm and interest of everybody grew in a steady crescendo, 
and no one i am sure will ever forget the impression left by the major-general who is deputed to come and tell us one or two things from the general staff in a quiet voice with a quiet smile he compared our position with that of a year ago told us facts about our numbers compared with the enemy's our guns compared with his the real position in the air the temporary superiority of the fokker that would vanish completely and finally in a month or so in everything we were now superior except heavy trench mortars and in a month or so we should have a big supply of them too and a damned sight heavier and we could afford to wait one got the impression that all our grousings and doubtings were completely out of date that up at the top now was a unity of command that had thought everything out and could afford to wait later on i forgot this impression but i remember it so well now even through verdun we could afford to wait we had all the cards now there was a sort of breathless silence throughout this quiet speech and when it ended with a good luck to you gentlemen there was applause but one's chief desire was to go outside and shout it was a bonfire mood best of all would have been a bonfire of daily mails we returned to our units on sunday ninth january nineteen sixteen by motor bus which conveyed us some sixty or seventy miles when we were dropped sergeant roberts myself and lewis my servant leaving lewis with my valise we walked in the moonlight up to montagne where i got the transport officer to send a limber for my valise o'brien on leave was the first thing i grasped as i tried to acclimatize myself to my surroundings leave my three months was up so i ought to get leave myself in a week or so in a few days in fact my first leave the next week was rosy from the prospect my second impression was like that of a poet full of a great sunset and trying to adjust myself to the dry unimaginative remarks of the rest of the community who have relegated sunsets to perdition during dinner for every one was so dull they groused they maligned the staff they were pessimistic they were ignorant oh profoundly ignorant they were in fact in a state of not having seen a vision i could not believe then that the time would come when i too should forget the vision and fix my eyes on the mud still for the moment i was immensely surprised though i was not such a fool as to start at once on a general reform of every one starting with the brigadier for under the commandant's influence one felt ready to tell off the brigadier if he didn't get motor buses to take your men to a divisional concert instead of saying the men must march three miles to it but as i say i restrained myself a week of field days of advance guards and attacks in open order of battalion drill company drill arm drill gas helmet drill lectures in the school in the evening and running drill before breakfast yet all the time i felt chafing to get back into the firing line i felt so much better equipped to command my men i wanted to practice all my new ideas then my leave came through leave comes through in the following manner the lucky man receives an envelope from the orderly room in the corner of which is written leave inside is an a form army form c twenty one twenty one with this magic inscription please note you will take charge of blank other ranks proceeding on leave to-morrow morning seventeenth instant they will parade outside orderly room at seven a m sharp then follow instructions as to where to meet the bus take charge if you blindfolded those fellows they would find their way somehow by the quickest route to blighty the officer is then an impossible person to live with he is continually jumping about upsetting everybody getting sandwiches and discussing england looking at the paper to see what's on in town talking being unnecessarily bright and cheery he is particularly offensive in the eyes of the man just come back from leave still it is his day abide with him until he clears off 
So they abode with me until the evening, and next morning Oliver and I started off in the darkness with our four followers. As we left the village, it was just beginning to lighten a little, and we met the drums just turning out, cold and sleepy. As we sprang down the hill, leaving Montagne behind us, faintly through the dawn we heard Reveille rousing our unfortunate comrades to another Monday morning. Then came the long, long journey that nobody minds really, though every one grumbles at it. At B, an hour's halt for omelettes and coffee and bread and jam, while the Y.M.C.A. stall supplied tea and buns innumerable. B will be a station known for all time to thousands. Do you remember B? we shall ask each other. Oh, yes, good omelettes one got there. Then the port, and fussy RTOs again. Why make a fuss when everyone is magnetized towards the boat? Under the light of a blazing gas jet squirting from a pendant ball, we crossed the gangway. There were men of old time who fell on their native earth and kissed it on returning after exile. We did not kiss the boards of Southampton Pierhead, but we understood the spirit that inspired that action as we steamed quietly along the Solent over a grey and violet sea. There were mists that morning, and the Hampshire coast was grey and vague. But steadily the engine throbbed, and we glided nearer and nearer, entered Southampton water, and at last were near enough to see houses and fields and people. People! English women! We disembarked. But what dull people to meet us! Officials and watermen who have seen hundreds of leave-boats arrive, every day, in fact. The last people to be able to respond to your feelings. Still, what does it matter? There is the train, and an English first. Someone started to run for one, and in a moment we were all running. But you have met us on leave. End of chapter 4 Chapter Five of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the March. On this leave, I most religiously visited relations and graciously received guests. For one thing, I felt it my duty to dispel all this ignorant pessimism that I found rolling about in large chunks like the thunder in Alice in Wonderland. I exacted apologies, humble apologies from them. How can we help it? they pleaded. We have no means of knowing anything except through the papers. No, I suppose you can't help it, I would reply, and forgive them from my throne of optimism. Eight days passed easily enough. After dinner sometimes comes indigestion. People enjoy the one and not the other. So after leave comes the return from leave the one in Tommy, French, bon, the other, no, bon. I hope I do not offend by calling the state of the latter a mental indigestion. It was with a kind of fierce joy that we threw out our bully and biscuits to the crowds of French children who lined the railway banks crying out, Bully beef, biscuit. The custom of supplying these rations on the leave train has long since been discontinued now, but in those days the little beggars used to know the time of the train to a nicety, and must have made a good trade of it. As soon as I got back to Montagne I heard a move was in the air, and I was delighted. I was fearfully keen to get back into the firing line again. I was full of life, and in the mood for adventure. I started a diary. Here are some extracts. 29th January, 1916 Lewis, my servant, brought in a bucket of water this morning, which contained ten per cent of mud. As the mud dribbled on to the green canvas of my bath during the end of the pouring, he saw it for the first time. Apparently the well is running dry. He managed to get some clean water, at length, and I had a great bath. Madame asked me, as I went in to breakfast, why I whistled getting up that morning. I tried to explain that I was in good spirits. 
it was an exhilarating morning outside was a great cawing of rooks and the slant sunlight lit up everything with a rich colour the mouldy green on the twigs of the apple trees was a joy to see later in the day i noticed how all this delicious morning light had gone seven p m orders have just come in for the move to-morrow loading party at six a m under edwards who was inwardly fed up but outwardly quite pleased valises to be ready by six forty five a m dixon grouses as usual at orders coming in late these moves always try the tempers of all concerned o'brien and edwards are now on the russell collecting kit we have accumulated rather a lot of papers books tins of ration tobacco etc madame was genuinely sorry to see us go we gave her a large but beautiful ornament for her mantelpiece suitably inscribed the dear soul was overwhelmed and drew cider from a cellar hitherto unknown to us which she pressed on our servants as well as on us we made the fellows drink it though they were not very keen on it thirty january nineteen sixteen montagne vaux en aminois i found myself suddenly detailed as o c rear party in lieu of edwards who has to remain in montagne and hand over to the incoming battalion at nine thirty three a s c lorries arrived and we loaded up i had about forty men for the job it was good to see these boys heaving up rolls of many-coloured blankets which filled nearly two lorries the third was packed with a mixture of boilers dixies brooms spades lamps etc the leather and skin waistcoats had to be left behind for a second journey i left the shoemaker sergeant and four men with these to await the return of one of the lorries as we worked a fog rolled up which was to stay all day edwards meanwhile saw to it that all the odd coal and wood left at the transport was taken to our good madame this much annoyed the groups of women who peered like vultures from the doorways ready to squabble over the pickings as soon as the last of us had departed farewell to montagne all the fellows were dull even sawyer the smiling who had been prominent with his cheery face in the loading up was silent and dull no life no spirit a mournful lot save for the plum-pudding dog that galloped ahead and on either flank smelling and pouncing and tossing his mongrel ears in delight he belonged to one of the men a gift from a warm-hearted daughter of france a dull lot i say i rallied them i persuaded i whistled hoping to put a tune into their dull hearts and as we swung downhill into Rincourt, they began to sing it was but a sorry thin sort of singing though like a winter sunshine there was no power behind it no joy no spontaneity suddenly however as we came into the village there was a company of warwicks falling in and every one sang like fury baker one of the last draft was the moving spirit but he is young to this life and later on when the fog had entered their souls again he said he could not well sing with a pack on yet is not that the very time to sing is not that the very virtue of singing the conquest of the poor old body by the indomitable spirit it was a fifteen-mile march at the third halt i gave half an hour for the eating of bread and cheese then was the hour of the plum pudding hound also appeared a sort of newfoundland collie very big in the hind quarters and very dirty as well as ill-bred between them they made rich harvests of crusts and cheese we sat on a bank along the road but after half an hour we were all getting cold in the raw air and i fell them in again and we got on our way soon they warmed up and whistled and sang for a quarter of an hour then silence returned and eyes turned to the ground again this march began to tell on the older men halford fell out and i sent corporal dewey to bring him along hastily scribbling the name of our destination on a slip torn from my field message book and giving it to him then riley fell out and flynn i began to dread the appearance of sergeant hayman from the rear to tell me of some one else they were men these who had been employed on various jobs the older and weaker men 
There was no skim shanking, for there was no Red Cross cart behind us. But no one else fell out, the pace was steady, and they were as fit as anything, these fellows. Then happened an incident. We had just turned off the main Amiens road, and come to a forked road. I halted a moment to make sure of the way by the map, and while I did so, apparently some sergeant from a regiment billeted in the village there told Sergeant Heyman that the battalion had taken the left road. The way was to the right, and as I struck up a steep hill, Sergeant Heyman ran up and told me the battalion, which had started nearly two hours before us, had gone to the left. "'I'm going to the right, sergeant,' said I, and the sergeant returned to the rear. "'Up, up, up! Grind, grind, grind!' I began to hear signs of doubt behind. "'Did you hear that? Said the battalion went t'other way,' and so on. "'Ain't he got a map all right?' from a believer. Three kilos more,' I said at the next stop. But some of the fellows had got it into their heads, I could see, that we were wrong. I studied the map. There was no doubt we were all right. Yet a mistake would be calamitous, as the men were very done. Ah, a kilo stone, two kilos to blank. A place not named on the map at all. This gave me a qualm, and behind came the usual mispronunciations of this annoying village on the stone. But lo, on the left came a turning as per map. Round we swung, downhill, and suddenly we were in a village. Another qualm as I saw it full of jocks. The doubters were just beginning to realize this fact, when we turned another corner, and almost fell on top of the C.O. In five minutes we were in billets. The next day we marched to the village of Quiriot. There I heard the guns again, after two months. 31st January this evening was full of the walking tour spirit, the spirit of good company. We were billeted at a farmhouse, and the farmer showed Captain Dixon and me all around his farm. He was full of pride in everything, of his horses first of all. There were three in the first stable, sleek and strong. Then we saw La Mer, a beautiful mare in foal. Then lastly there was Piccaninny, a yearling. All the stables were spotlessly clean, and the animals well kept. But to see him with his lambs was best of all. The ewes were feeding from the racks that ran all along both sides of the sheds, and his lantern showed two long rows of level backs, solid and uniform and dull, while in the middle of the shed was a jocund company of close-cropped lambs, frisking, pushing, jostling, or pulling at their dams, as lively and naughty a crew as you could imagine. "'Ah! Volure! cried our friend, picking up a lamb that was stealing a drink from the wrong tap, and pointing to its dam at the other end of the shed. He fondled and stroked it like a puppy, making us hold it, and assuring us it was not méchant. At seven we had our dinner in the kitchen. The farmer, his wife, and the domestique, a man-servant, whose history I will tell in a few minutes, had just finished, and were going to clear off, but we asked them to stay and let us drink their health in whiskey and soda. The farmer said this was wont to make the domestique go zigzag. For himself he would drink, not for the inherent pleasure of the whiskey, which was a strong drink to which he was unused, he being of the land of light wines, but to give us pleasure. So the usual healths were given, in Old Orkney and Perrier. Then we were told the history of the domestique, which brought us very close to the spirit in which France is fighting. He had eight children in Perron, barely ten miles the other side of the line. Called up in September, 1914, he was in the trenches until March, 1915, when he was released on account of his eight children but by then the living line had set between them in steel and blood, and never a word yet has he heard of his wife and eight children, the youngest of whom he left nine days old. There are times when our cause seems clouded with false motives, but there seemed no doubt on this score to-night, as we watched this man in his own land, creeping up, as it were, as near as possible to his wife and children and home, and yet barred from his own village, 
and without the knowledge even that his own dear ones were alive. The farmer told us he had gone half crazed. Yet he had a fine face, though furrowed with deep lines down his forehead. Ten minutes in the yard with the Germans, ah, what would he do? And vividly he drew his hand across his throat. But the Germans would never go back. That was another of his opinions. No wonder he told us he doubted the bon Dieu. No wonder he sometimes went zigzag. The farmer was well educated, and had very intelligent views on the war. One son was a captain, the other was also serving in some capacity. The wife made us good coffee, but got very sleepy. I learned she rose every morning at four a.m. to milk the cows. Tonight we can hear the guns. There seems a considerable liveliness at several parts of the line, and strange rumours of the Germans breaking through, which I do not believe. Tomorrow we shall be within the shell zone again. February 1st. Today we marched to Morlancourt, and are spending the night in huts. It is very cold, and we have a brazier made out of a biscuit tin, but it smokes abominably. We are busy getting trench kit ready for the next day. From outside the hut I can see starlights, and hear machine guns tapping. It thrills like the turning up of the footlights. And it was a long act. The curtain did not fall till June. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Bois Francais Trenches. This is a chapter of maps, diagrams, and technicalities. There are people, I know, who do not want maps, to whom maps convey practically nothing. These people can skip this chapter, and, from their point of view, they will lose nothing. The main interest of life lies in what is done and thought, and it does not much matter exactly where these acts and thoughts take place. Maps are like anatomy. To some people it is of absorbing interest to know where our bones, muscles, arteries and all the rest of our interior lie. To others these things are of no account whatever. Yet all are alike interested in human people. And so, quite understanding, I think you are really very romantic in your dislike of maps, you associate them with the duller kind of history and examination papers. I bid you mapless ones farewell till page 117, promising you, again, that you shall lose nothing. Now to work. We understand each other, we map lovers. The other folk have gone on to the next chapter, so we can take our time. It is the trenches at Bois Francais that we held for over four months. I may fairly claim to know every inch of them, I think. It is obvious that if you are at Bois Francais and look north, you have an uninterrupted view not only of both front lines running down into Fricourt Valley, but of both lines running up on to the high ground north of Fricourt, and a very fine view indeed of Fricourt itself, and Fricourt Wood. It is also quite clear that from their front lines north of Fricourt the Germans had a good view of our front lines and communications in the valley. But of Bois Francais and our trenches east of it they had no enfilade view, as all our communications were on the reverse slope of this shoulder of high ground. So as regards observation we were best off. Moreover, whereas they could not possibly see our support lines and communications at Bois Francais, we could get a certain amount of enfilade observation of their trenches opposite from point 87, where there was a work called Boot Redoubt and an artillery observation post. The position of the artillery immediately becomes clear when the lie of the ground is once grasped for field artillery and fillade fire is far more effective as the trajectory is lower than that of heavy artillery. That is to say, a whiz-bang, the name given to an eighteen-pound shell, more or less skims along the ground and comes at you, whereas howitzers fire up in the air and the shell rushes down on top of you. If a battery of eighteen-pounders can fire up a trench 
it has far more effect against the nine men in that trench than if it fires at it broadside. The same applies, of course, to howitzers, but as howitzers drop shells down almost perpendicularly, they can be used with great effect traversing along a trench, that is to say, getting the exact range of the trench, and dropping shells methodically from right to left, or left to right, so many to each fire bay, and dodging about a bit, and going back on to a bit out of turn, so that the enemy cannot tell where the next coal box is coming. Oh, it is a great game this for the actors, but not for the unwilling audience. A battery of field artillery stationed in a gully could bring excellent enfilade fire onto the German trenches. Howitzers lived in all sorts of secret places. One never worried about them. They knew their business. Once, in June, on our way into the trenches, we halted close by a battery, and I looked into one of the gun pits and saw the terrible monster sitting with its long nose in the air, and I saw the great shells waiting in rows but I felt like an interloper, and fled at the approach of a gunner. All these howitzers you see firing on the Somme films we never saw or thought about, only we loved to hear their shells whistling and griding. If there is no such word, I cannot help it, there is an R and a D in the sound anyway. Over our head, and falling crump, 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 along the German support trenches, there were a lot of batteries in the Bois de Tailly. The woods were full of them, and grew fuller and fuller. I do not know what they all were. As one brigade contains four battalions, we almost invariably had two battalions in the line, and two in billets. So it was usually six days in and six days out. During these six days out, we also invariably supplied four working parties per company which lasted nine hours from the time of falling in outside company headquarters to dismissing after marching back. Still, it was billets. One slept uninterruptedly, and with equipment and boots off. Now we were undeniably lucky in being invariably, from February to June 1916, billeted in Morland Corps, which is situated in a regular cup with high ground all round it. It was a cosy spot, and a very jolly thing after that long, long weary grind, up from Meo at the end of a weary six days in, to look down on the snug little village waiting for you below. For once over the hill, and swinging down into Moreland Corps, one became, as it were, cut off from the war suddenly and completely. It was somewhat like shutting the door on a stormy night. Everything outside was going on just the same but with it was shut out also a wearing, straining tension of body and mind. Yes, we were very lucky in being billeted at Morland Corps. It was just too far off to be worth shelling, whereas Bray was shelled regularly almost every day. So was Mion, and there were brigades billeted in both Bray and Mion. There were troops in tents in the Bois de Tailly, and this too was sometimes shelled. We were always able to relieve by day, thanks to the rolling nature of the country. We always used to go by the route through Mayon at one time, until they took to shelling the road. Whether they could see us from an observation post up La Bozeille way, or whether they spotted us by observation balloon or aeroplane, one cannot say. But latterly, we always used the route by the Bois de Tailly and Gibraltar. In both cases we had to cross high ground, but on arrival we were again in a valley and out of observation. All along this road were a series of dugouts, and here were companies in reserve, R.E. headquarters, R.A.M.C. dressing station, field kitchens, stores, etc. And here the transport brought up rations every evening via Bray. One could walk about here completely secure from view but latterly they took to shelling it, and it was not a healthy spot then. It was also enfiladed occasionally by long-range machine-gun fire, but on the whole it was a good spot, and one had a curious sensation being able to walk about on an open road within a thousand yards of the Germans. The dugouts, called 71 North, were the best. 
the bank sloped up very steeply from the road thus protecting the dugouts along it from anything but shell-fire of very high trajectory and this the germans never used however one did not want to walk too far along the road for it led round the corner into full view of fricourt there was a trench at the side of the road that ought to be hopped down into but it could easily be missed and there was no barrier across the road i saw a motorcyclist dash right along to the corner once and return very speedily when he found himself gazing full view at fricourt a map of our area of fighting gives details of our trenches and the german trenches opposite i wish i could convey the sense of intimacy with which i am filled when i look at this map it is something like the feelings i should ascribe to a farmer looking at a map of his property every inch of which he knows by heart every field every copse every lane every hollow and hill are intimate things to him with every corner he has some association every tree cut down every fence repaired every road made up every few hundred yards of shaw grubbed up every acre of orchard enclosed and planted all these he can call back to memory at his will so do i know every corner every turning in these trenches every traverse has its peculiar familiarity very often its peculiar history this traverse was built the night after p's death this trench was dug because seventy five street was so marked down by the enemy rifle grenades another was a terrible straight trench till we built those traverses in it another was a morass until we boarded it how well i remember being half buried by a canister at the corner of seventy eight street and the night the mine blew in all the trench between the fort and the loop what an awful dug-out that was at trafalgar square how we loathed the straightness of Watling Street, and so on ad infinitum. We were in those trenches for over four months, and I know them as one knows the creaking of the doors at home, the subtle smell of the bathroom, the dusty atmosphere of the box-room, or the lowness of the cellar door. Particularly intimate are the recollections of dugouts, with their good or bad conveniences in the way of beds and tables their beams that smote you on the head as regularly as clockwork, or their peculiarly musty smell. One dugout invariably smelt of high rodent, another of sandbag, nothing but sandbag. From February, then, to June, we kept on going into these trenches and then back to Morlancourt for rest and working parties, all as regular as clockwork once or twice the actual front line held by our battalion was altered so that i have been in the trenches all along from the cemetery down in the valley to the end of the craters opposite danube trench b maple redoubt was what is known as a strong point in case of an enemy attack piercing our front line the company in maple redoubt held out at all costs to the last man even if the enemy got right past and down the hill there was a dug-out which was provisioned full up with bully beef and water in empty petrol cans ready for this emergency there was a certain amount of barbed wire put out in front of the trenches and there were two lewis gun positions really it was not a bad little place although the defences of maple redoubt were always looked on by us as rather more of a big joke than anything no one ever really took seriously the thought of the enemy coming over and reaching maple redoubt raid the front line he was liable to do at any moment but attack on such a big scale as to come right through no no one really ever beneath the rank of battalion commander anyway worried about that still if he did there was the redoubt anyway and there was another called redoubt a on the hill facing us as one looked from maple redoubt across the smoke rising from dugouts which could just not be seen under the bank at seventy one north here was rumoured to be bully beef and water also and the machine-gun corps had some positions in it which they visited occasionally but even a notice no one allowed this way failed to tempt me to explore its interior one saw it traced out on the hill from maple redoubt and there i have no doubt it still is 
with its bully beef intact and its water a little stale. So much for Maple Redoubt. In case of attack, as I have said, it was a strong point that must hold out at all costs, while the company at 71 North came up to Rue Albert, and would support either of the front companies as the C.O. directed. The front companies, of course, held the front line to the last man. Meanwhile, the two battalions in billets would be marching up from Morland Corps, to the high ground above Redoubt A. Up there were a series of entrenched works, known as the Intermediate Line. The battalions marching up from billets might have to hold these positions, or, what was more likely, be ordered to counter-attack immediately. Such was the defence scheme. Six days in billets, three days in support. Not particularly hard, that sounds, I can hear someone say. I tried to disillusion people in an earlier chapter about the easiness of the rest in billets, owing to the incessant working parties. These were even more incessant during these four months. Let me say a few words, then, also, about life in support trenches. I admit that for officers it was not always an over-strenuous time, but look at Tommy's ordinary programme. This would be a typical day, say in April. 4 a.m. stand to, until it got light enough to clean your rifle, then clean it. About 5 a.m. get your rifle inspected, and turn in again. 6.30 a.m. turn out to carry breakfast up to company in front line. Old Kent Road very muddy after rain. A heavy Dixie to be carried from top of Weymouth Avenue, up via Trafalgar Square and 76th Street, to the platoon holding the trench at the loop. 7.45 a.m. get your breakfast. 9 a.m. turn out for working party. Spend morning filling sandbags for building traverses in Maple Redoubt. 11.30 a.m. carry dinner up to front company. Same at 6.30 a.m. 1 p.m. get your own dinner. 1 to 4 p.m. with luck, rest. 4 p.m. carry tea up to front company. 5 p.m. get your own tea. 5.15 to 7.15 p.m. with luck, rest. 7.15 p.m. clean rifle. 7.30 p.m. stand to, rifle inspected. Jones puts his big ugly boot out suddenly, just after you have finished cleaning rifle, and upsets it. Result? Mud all over barrel and nose cap. 8.30 p.m. stand down. Have to clean rifle again and show platoon sergeant. 9 p.m. Turn out for working party till 12 midnight in front line. 12 midnight, hot soup. 12.15 a.m. Dug out at last till 4 a.m. Stand to. And so on for three days and nights. This is really quite a moderate program. It is one that you will aim at for your men. But there are disturbing elements that sometimes compel you to dock a man's afternoon rest, for instance. A couple of canisters block Watling Street. You must send a party of ten men and an NCO to clear it at once. Or you suddenly have to supply a party to carry footballs up to Rue Albert for the trench mortar man. The adjutant is sorry, he could not let you know before. But they have just come up to the citadel and must be unloaded at once. So you have to find the men for this on the spur of the moment. And so it goes on day and night. Oh, it's not all rum and sleep, is life in Maple Redoubt. Three days and nights in support, and then comes the three days in the front line. Almost the whole of no man's land, in front of a certain sector of trenches, is a chain of mine craters. No one can have much idea of a crater until he actually sees one. I can best describe it as a hollow, like a quarry or chalk hole about fifty yards in diameter, and some forty or fifty feet deep. They vary in size, of course, but that is about the average. The sides, which are steepish, and vary in angle between thirty and sixty degrees, are composed of a very fine thin soil which is, in point of fact, a thick sediment of powdered soil that has returned to earth after a tempestuous ascent into the sky. A large mine always causes a lip above the ground level. There is usually water in the bottom of the deeper craters. 
when a series of craters is formed running into one another you get a very uneven floor one would not keep in the centre where the crater contained water but would skirt the water by going to one side of it the bridges are important as they are naturally the easiest way across the craters a bombing patrol for instance could crawl over a bridge without having to go right down to the bottom level and which is more important will not have a steep climb up over very soft and spongy soil these bridges are the lips of the larger craters when they join the smaller this crater chain being understood the system of sentries is easily grasped originally before mining commenced our front line ran roughly in a straight line then began the great game of mining under the enemy parapet and blowing him up and its corollary countermining or blowing up the enemy's mine galleries before he reached your parapet such is the game as played underground by the tunnelling companies r e to the infantry belongs the work if not blown up of consolidating the crater whether made by your or an enemy mine that is to say of seizing your side of the crater and guarding it by bombing posts in such a way as to prevent the enemy from doing anything except hold his side of the crater for instance take a single crater caused by us blowing up the german gallery before it reaches our parapet if we do nothing the enemy digs a trench into the crater and can get into the crater any time he likes and bomb our front line and return to his trench unseen this of course never happens as we dig a sap into the crater from our side and the result is stalemate each side can see into the crater so neither can go into it each platoon has many posts to find men for all these posts are composed of one bomber who has a box of bombs with him and his rifle without bayonet fixed and one bayonet man there is no special structure about a post it is just the spot in the trench where the sentries are placed sometimes one or two posts could be dispensed with by day if one post could with a periscope watch the ground in front of both the sentry groups are relieved every two hours by the platoon nco on trench duty there is always an nco on trench duty going the rounds of his sentry groups in every platoon and one officer going round the groups in the company thus is secured the endless chain of unwinking eyes that stretches from dunkirk to switzerland there were two lewis guns to every company the lewis gun teams found their sentries independently of the platoons and had their dugouts a nice compact little affair with a lewis gun team always very snug and self-contained each platoon had a dugout about fifty yards behind the front line and as far as possible one arranged to get the men a few hours sleep in them every day but only a certain percentage at a time there were four stretcher-bearers and two signallers also a permanent wiring party had its quarters here a corporal and five men they made up concertina or gooseberry wire by day and were out three or four hours every night putting it out they were of course exempt from other platoon duties every platoon had a pioneer to attend to sanitary arrangements and other odd jobs such as fetching up soup and each platoon had an orderly ready to take messages at company headquarters besides the officers servants were the company orderly and company officers cook an officer on trench duty was accompanied by his servant as orderly this was the distribution of the company in the front line every morning from nine to twelve all men not on sentry worked at repairing and improving the trenches and the same for four hours during the night work done to strengthen the parapet can only be done by night every night wire was put out every night a patrol went out every day one stood to arms for an hour before dawn and an hour after dusk and day and night there was an intermittent stinging and buzzing of black-winged instruments between the opposing trenches of shells i have already spoken next in deadliness were rifle grenades which are bombs with a rod attachment that is put down the barrel of an ordinary rifle 
Four of these rifles are stood in a rack fixed to the ground, and fired by a string from a few yards away at a very high trajectory. They are a very deadly weapon, as you cannot see them dropping on to you. Then there is a multiform genus called trench mortar, being projectiles of all kinds and shapes lobbed over from close range. The canister was the most loathed. It was simply a tin oil can, the size of a lady's muff, large. One heard a thud, and watched the beast rising, rising, then stationary, it seemed, in mid-air, and then come toppling down, 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 on top of one with a crash, three seconds silence, and then a most colossal explosion, blowing everything in its vicinity to atoms. These canisters were loathed by the men with a most personal and intense aversion, yet they were really not nearly as dangerous as rifle grenades, as one had time to dodge them very often, unless enfiladed in a communication trench. They were, moreover, very local in their effects. A shell has splinters that spread far and wide. A trench mortar is a clumsy monster with a thin skin, no splinters, and an abominable, noisy, vulgar way of making the most of itself. Sausages were another but milder form of the vulgar trench mortar. Aerial torpedoes were daintier people with wings, who looked so cherubic as they came sailing over, that one almost forgot their deadly stinging powers. They, too, were a species of trench mortar. It is natural to write lightly of these things, yet they were no light matters. They were the instruments of death that took their daily toll of lives. In this chapter, describing the system and routine of ordinary trench warfare, I have tried to prepare the canvas for several pictures I have drawn in bold, bare lines. Now I am putting in a wash of colour, the atmosphere of death. Sometimes we forget it in the interest of the present activity. Sometimes we saw it face to face, without a qualm. But always it was there with its relentless, overhanging presence, dulling our spirits, wearing out our lives. The papers are always full of Tommy smiling. Bairn's father has immortalized his indomitable humour. Yes, it is true. We laugh, we smile. But for an hour of laughter there are how many hours of weariness, strain, and grim agony. It is great that Tommy's laughter has been immortalized, but do not forget that its greatness lies in this, that it was uttered beneath the canopy of ever-impending death. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. More First Impressions It must not be imagined that I at once grasped all the essential details of our trench system, as I have tried to put them concisely in the preceding chapter. On the contrary, it was only very gradually that I accumulated my intimate knowledge of our maze of trenches, only by degrees that I learnt the lie of the land, and only by personal patrolling that I learned the interior economy of the craters. At first the front line, with its loops and bombing posts, and portions patrolled only, its sandbag dumps, its unexpected visions of R.E.s scurrying like bolted rabbits from mine shafts, its sudden jerk round a corner that brought you in full view of the German parapet across a crater that made you gaze fascinated several seconds before you realized that you should be stooping low, as here was a bad bit of trench that wanted deepening at once, and had not been cleared properly after being blown in last night, all this, I say, was first a most perplexing labyrinth. It was only gradually that I solved its mysteries, and discovered an order in its complexity. I will give a few more extracts from my diary, some of which seem to me now delightfully naive. Here they are, though. 2nd February, 1916. In the trenches. Everything very quiet. We are in support, in a place called Maple Redoubt, on the reverse slope of a big ridge good dug-outs and a view behind, over a big expanse of chalk-downs, which is most exhilarating. 
a day with blue sky and a tingle of frost. Being on the reverse slope, you can walk about anywhere, and so can see everything. Have just been up in the front trenches, which are over the ridge, and a regular, or rather very irregular, rabbit warren, the Bosch generally only about thirty to forty yards away. The trenches are dry, that is the glorious thing. Just off to powwow to the new members of my platoon. Here I will merely remark that the good dugout in which we were living was blown in by a 4-2 shell exactly four days later, killing one officer and wounding the other two badly. With regard to the state of the trenches, it was dry weather, and when they were dry they were dry, and when they were wet they were wet. 3rd February. Another beautiful February morning. Slept quite well, despite rats overhead. O'Brien and Dixon awfully dull and heavy. Can't think why. Everything outside is full of life. There is a crispness in the air, and a delightful sharp shadow and light contrast as you look up Maple Redoubt. Meditations on coldness, and how it unmans, on hunger, and how it weakens, on the art of feeding and warming, and how women realize this, while men do not usually know there is any art in keeping house at all. Meditations, too, on the stupidity, slowness, and clumsiness of officers' servants. Dixon's snores make me bucked with life. So, too, this same clumsiness of the servants. Lewis came in just now. "'Why are you waiting, Lewis?' I asked. "'I thought Watson was waiting today." this after a great strafing of servants for general stupidity and incompetence. "'None of the others dared come in, sir,' he replied, in his high piping voice, and a broad grin on his face. "'Oh, they are good fellows. Why be fed up with life? Why long faces? Long faces! These are the bad things of life, the things to fight against.' "'So did my vision of the Third Army School bear fruit, I see now.' Philosophy from the trenches. Does it cover everything? Does it explain the fellows I passed this morning, being carried to the aid post, one with blood and orange iodine all over his face, and the other wounded in both legs? It always comes as a surprise when the bombs and shells produce wounds and death. Watched a mine go up this evening, great yellow-brown mass of smoke, followed by a beautiful undercloud of orange-pink that steamed up in a soft, creamy way. No firing and shelling followed as a Givenchy. Take over from A tomorrow morning. 10 p.m. Great starlight. Jupiter and Venus both up, and the great bear and Orion glittering hard and clean in the steely sky. I wish I had a homer. I am sure he had just one perfect epithet for Orion on a night like this. I shall read Homer in a new light after these times. I begin to understand the spirit of the Homeric heroes. It was all words, words, words before. Now I see. Billet life. Where is that in the Iliad? In the tents, of course. And the eating and drinking. The word that puts heart into men. The cool, stolid facing of death all those gruesome details of wounds and weapons, all is being enacted here every day exactly as in the Homeric age. Human nature has not altered. And did not Homer tell, too, how utterly fed up they were with it all? Can one not read between the lines and see beside the glamour of physical courage, the strain, the weariness, the fed-upness of them all? I think so. Nutols is a word I remember so well. They were all longing for the day of their return. As here, the big fights were few and far between. And as here, there were the months and years of waiting. And on them, too, the stars looked down, winking alike at Greeks and Trojans. Just as to-night, thousands of German and British faces, dull-witted or sharp, sour-faced or smiling, sad or happy, are gazing up and wondering if there is any wisdom in the world yet. Four thousand years ago? And all the time the stars in the great bear have been hurtling apart at thousands of miles an hour, and the human eye sees no difference. No wonder they wink at us. And our mothers and wives, 
the women folk euripides understood their views on war ten years they waited must go to bed damn these scuffling rats frequently i found my thoughts flying back through the years and more especially on starlit nights or on a breathless spring evening to the greeks and romans life out here was so primitive so much a matter of eating and drinking and digging and sleeping and so full of the elements of cold and frost and wind and rain there were so many definite and positive physical goods and bads that the barrier of an unreal civilization was completely swept away under the stars and in a trench you were as good as any homeric warrior but you were little better and so you felt you understood him and here i will add that it was especially at sunset that the passionate desire to live would sometimes surge up so intense so clamorous that it swept every other feeling clean aside for the time but to return to maple redoubt or rather to gibraltar where the next entry in my diary was written sixth february rather an uncomfortable dug-out in gibraltar yesterday was a divine day i sat up in the fort most of the day watching the bombardment blue sky on the top of a high chalk down larks singing and a real sunny dance in the air we watched four aeroplanes sail over amid white puffs of shrapnel and a german plane came over i could see the black crosses very plainly with my glasses most godlike it must have been up there on such a morning i felt very pleased with life and did two sketches one of sawyer another of richards a dull thud and then there goes another shouts someone it reminds me of bill the lizard coming out of the chimney pot in alice in wonderland everyone gazes and waits for the crash toppling through the sky comes a big tin oil can followed immediately by another both fall and explode with a tremendous din sending up a fifty-foot spurt of black earth and flying debris while down the wind comes the scud of sandbag fluff and the smell of powder this alternated with the four twos which came over with a scream and wait politely a second or two before bursting so inelegantly i seem to have got mixed up a bit here it was usually the canisters that waited the mining is a great mystery to me at present one part of the trench is only patrolled as the bosch may blow there at any moment i must say it is an uncomfortable feeling this liability to sudden project skywards the first night i had a sort of nightmare all the time and kept waking up and thinking about a mine going up under one the second night i was too tired to have nightmares the rats swarm i woke up last night and saw one sitting on edwards licking its whiskers then it ran on to the box by the candle it was a pretty brown fellow rather attractive i thought i felt no repulsion whatever at sight of it the front trenches are a maze i cannot disentangle all the loops and saps and now we are cut off from c as the front trench is all blown in one has to have a connecting patrol that goes via rue albert a very weird affair the only consolation is that the boche would be more lost if he got in i cannot help feeling that b company has been very lucky we were in maple redoubt wednesday thursday and friday everything was quite quiet with us but d had seven casualties in the front trench on friday we relieved a and all saturday the enemy bombarded a spot just behind our company's left putting over four twos and canisters all day long from nine a m onwards and absolutely smashing up our trenches there then trafalgar square has been rather a hot shop two of our own whizbangs fell short there and several rifle grenades fell very close also splinters of the four twos came humming round ending with little plops quite close o'brien picked up a large splinter that fell in the trench right outside the dugout again at stand down when dixon clark edwards and i were standing talking together at the top of seventy sixth street two canisters fell most alarmingly near us 
about ten yards behind, covering us with dirt. Yet we have not had a single casualty. Today we were to have been relieved by the Manchesters at midday, but this morning at Stand To we heard the time had been altered to 8 a.m. B was duly relieved, and No. 5 platoon had just changed gum boots, while 6, 7, and 8 were sitting at the corner of Maple Redoubt enthralled in the same process, when over came two canisters, one smashing in Old Kent Road, down which we had just come, and the other falling right into an A Company dugout, twenty yards to my left, killing two men and wounding three others, one probably mortally. And now I have just had the news that the Manchester have had twenty-three casualties to-day, including three officers, their RSM, and a company sergeant major. As I read some of these sentences, true in every detail as they are, I cannot help smiling, for it was no bombardment that took place on our left all day, it was merely the Germans potting one of our trench-mortar positions. And Trafalgar Square was really very quiet, that first time in. But what I notice most is the way in which I record the fall of individual canisters and rifle grenades, even if they were twenty yards away. Never a six days in, latterly, that we did not have to clear Old Kent Road and Watling Street two or three times. And we used to fire off a hundred rifle grenades a day very often, and received as many in return always. And the record of casualties one did not keep. We were lucky, it is true. Once and once only, after, did B Company go in and come out without a casualty. Those first two days in Maple Redoubt, when everything was quiet, were the most deceitful harbingers of the future that could have been imagined. Why long faces? I could write. The Manchesters had a ruder, but a truer introduction to the Bois Francais trenches, and especially to Maple Redoubt, for the dugouts were abominable. Not one was shell-proof, and there was no parados or traverse for a hundred and fifty yards. The truth of the matter was that these trenches had been some of the quietest in the line. For some reason or other, when our division took them over, they immediately changed face about, and took upon themselves the task of growing in a steady, relentless crescendo into one of the hottest sections in the line. On the 22nd of February the Germans raided our trenches on the left opposite Fricourt. They did not get much change out of it. I can remember at least four raids close on our left, or right, during those four months. They never actually came over on our front, but we usually came in for the bombardment. The plan is to isolate the sector to be raided by an intense bombardment on that sector, and on the sectors on each side, to lift the barrage or curtain of fire at a given moment off the front line of the sector raided, what time, as the old phrase goes, they come over, enter the trench, if they can, make a few prisoners, and get back quickly. All the while, the sectors to right and left are being bombarded heavily. It was this isolating bombardment that our front line was receiving, while we were left unmolested in 71 North. All this I did not know at the time. Here is my record of it. 25 February, 1916. It is snowing hard. We are in a very comfortable tubular dugout in 71 North. This dugout is the latest pattern, being on the two-penny tube model. Very warm and free from draughts. It is not shell-proof, but then shells never seem to come near here. Let me try and record the raid on our left on the 22nd, before I forget it. The Manchesters were in the front line and Maple Redoubt. During the afternoon the Bosch started putting heavies on to Maple Redoubt and the corner of Canterbury Avenue. Bad luck on the Manchesters again, we all agreed, and turned in for tea. There was a wonderful good fire going. By Jove, they are going it, I said, as we sat down and Gray brought in the teapot. Thud, 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 thud. We simply had to go out and watch. Regular coal boxes sending up great columns of mud and splinters humming and splashing right over us, a good hundred yards or more. Better keep inside, from Dixon. 
We had tea, and things seemed to quiet down. Then about six o'clock the bombardment got louder, and our guns woke up like fun. Vee boom vee boom from our whiz-bangs going over, and then the machine-guns began on our left. Simultaneously in came Richards, Dixon's servant, with an excited air. Gas! he exclaimed. Instinctively I felt for my gas helmet. Meanwhile Dixon had gone outside. Absurd, he said in a quiet voice. The wind's wrong. Who brought that message? Then up came a telephone orderly. I heard him running on the hard road. Stand to, he said breathlessly, and Dixon went off to phone with him. Nicholson appeared in a gas helmet. I was looking for my pipe, but could not find it. Then at last I went out without it. Outside it was getting dark. It was a fairly nippy air. The bombardment was going strong. All the sky was flickering, and our guns were screaming over. Crump! Crump! The Bosch shells were bursting up by Maple Redoubt. Scream! Scream! went our guns back, and right overhead our big guns went griding. All this I noticed gradually. My first impression was the strong smell of gas helmets in the cold air. The gas alarm had spread, and some of the men had their helmets on. I felt undecided. I simply did not know whether the men should wear them or not. What was happening? I wished Dixon would come back. Ah, there he was. What news? I can't get through, he said. But we shall get a message all right if necessary. What's happening? I asked. Do you think they are coming over? No, it won't last long, I expect. Still, just let's see if the men have got their emergency rations with them. A few had not, and were sent into the dugouts for them. Gas helmets were ordered back into their satchels. No possibility of gas, said Dixon. Wind's dead south. I was immensely bucked now. There was a feeling of tenseness and bracing up. I felt the importance of essentials. Rifles and bayonets in good order, the men fit and able to run. This was the real thing, somehow. I made Lewis go in and get my pipe. I found I had no pouch and stuffed loose backy in my pocket. I realized I had not thought out what I would do in case of attack. I did not know what was happening. I was glad Dixon was there. It was great, though, to hear the continuous roar of the cannonade and the machine-guns rapping, not for five minutes, but all the time. That, I think, was the most novel sound of all. No news, that was a new feature. A Manchester officer came up and said all their communications were cut with the left. I was immensely bucked, especially with my pipe. Our servants were good friends to have behind us, and Dixon was a man in his element. The men were all cool. Germans have broken through, I heard one man say. Where? said someone rather excitedly. In the North Sea, was the stolid reply. At last the cannonade developed into a roar on our left, and we realized that any show was there, and not on our sector. Then up came the quartermaster with some boots for Dixon and me, and we all went out into the dugout, where was a splendid fire. And we stayed there, and certain humorous remarks from the quartermaster suddenly turned my feelings, and I felt that the tension was gone, the thing was over, and that outside the bombardment was slackening. In half an hour it was stand-down at 7.40. I was immensely bucked. I knew I should be all right now in an attack, and the cannonade at night was a magnificent sight. Of course we had not been shelled, though some whiz-bangs had been fired fifty yards behind us just above Redoubt A, trying for the battery just over the hill. My chief impression was, this is the real thing. You must know your men. They await clear orders, that is all. It was dark. I remember thinking of brigade and division behind, invisible, seeing nothing, yet alone knowing what was happening. No news, that was interesting. An entirely false rumour came along. All dugouts blown in in Maple Redoubt. I had sent Evans to Bray to try and buy coal. 
he returned in the middle of the bombardment with a long explanation of why he had been unable to get it. Afterwards, I said, somehow Cole could wait. All the while I have been writing this, there is a regular blizzard outside. Such is my record of my first bombardment. The Manchesters, who were in the front line, suffered rather heavily, but not in Maple Redoubt. No dugouts were smashed in at all there, though Canterbury Avenue was blocked in two places, and Old Kent Road in one. The Germans came over from just north of Freecorps, but only a very few reached our trenches, and of them about a dozen were made prisoners, and the rest killed. It was a bad show from the enemy point of view. And now I will leave my diary. These first impressions are interesting enough, but later the entries become more and more spasmodic, and usually introspective. The remaining chapters are not exactly, though very nearly, chronological. From February 6th to March 8th, I was sniping an intelligence officer to the battalion. Chapters 8, 9, and 12 describe incidents in that period. Then on March 8th, Captain Dixon was transferred as second in command to our blank battalion, and on that date I took over the command of B Company, which I held until I was wounded on the 7th of June. These were the three months in which I learnt the strain of responsibility as well as the true tragedy of this war. During all these four months I was fortunate in having as a commanding officer a really great soldier. The C.O. had inaugurated his arrival by a vigorous emphasis of the following principle. No man's land belongs to us. If the Bosch dare show his face in it, he's going to be damned sorry for it. We are top dogs, and if there is any strafing, the last word must always be ours. Such was the policy of the man behind me during those four months. Meanwhile, from eight to midnight every night, trenches were being deepened, the parapet thickened, and fire-steps and traverses being put in the front line, which had hitherto been a maze of hasty improvisations. Barbed wire was put out at an unprecedented pace, and patrols were going out every night. If things went wrong, there was the devil to pay. But if things went well, one was left entirely unmolested. And if there was a bombardment on, the orders came quick and clear. And any company commander will know that those three qualities in a commanding officer are worth almost anything. End of chapter 7